I'm uh, looking forward to spending a nice uh, ecological evening uh, talking with you all about the uh, Pinelands uh, flora and fauna. Uh, this time of year, you know, uh, particularly if I didn't do much skiing, I really start to think about uh, fishing. And so I figured I'd start with one of our uh, largest uh, uh, fish, native fish in the Pine Barrens. And uh, right here is a chain pickerel. And uh, this guy happened to be about 25 inches and he was uh, safely caught and released uh, in the Pine Barrens and is kind of on the bigger end. I've heard stories of bigger ones, but I think that is the biggest one I've ever caught. And uh, just a real good example of a uh, Pinelands native species, the uh, chain pickerel. So I figured that was a good spot to start. Um, oh. Let's see. I'm having a hard time advancing my slide. Oh, there uh, we go. There is a, oh, I, I, go. I, I got it figured out. Sorry okay. about that. I guess that <laughs> no was a, a rookie mistake. <laughs> so uh, to start out, I just want to set some basic parameters and talk about, uh, you know, Pinelands characteristics. What do we mean by the Pinelands? Why is the Pinelands different? Uh, how does that affect certain animals? And uh, so we'll start with some Pinelands uh, characteristics. Uh, the water and the soil is really the key in a lot of ways. Um, in both accounts, the pH is very low. A good characteristic Pinelands uh, stream, for instance, may have a pH of 3.5 to 5.5. So that's uh, definitely on the acidic side. Uh, you know, base normal pH is around seven. So uh, the plants and animals that are thriving here in the Pine Barrens or Pinelands, I use them all the time, both interchangeably really need that acidic condition. And when that changes, we definitely see a loss of our, our native species, uh, both plants and animals. So when there's uh, inputs into the system or disturbance that's gonna raise the pH, you're gonna start to see some changes in the makeup of the, uh, the fauna and the fauna. Uh, sandy soils, uh, if you spent any time in the Pine Barrens at all, you know about the sugar sand. Um, you know, it could rain in the morning and there could be a forest fire in the afternoon. And uh, that's something that you, if you grow up right around here, you're, you're always very well aware of. Uh, we know that there are places in the Pinelands that have the capacity to absorb well over six inches of rain per hour. So it definitely um, you know, works as like a water filter is the best way I can describe it. The Pinelands, all the open uplands collect that water and it goes down into the aquifer system below, which we'll talk about uh, in, in the future. Um, very fire prone. Uh, right now, March is kind of the end of the controlled burning season. So the last couple of weeks, you might have seen some big plumes and some, uh, some big fires, and that's part of the controlled burn. And uh, the forest fire season typically takes place in April and May. And, uh, you know, historically, that's when the worst fires have happened in the Pine Barrens, because generally we have windy conditions. It is pretty wet, but like we said, the water goes quickly down to the ground and uh, it can rain in the morning and there could be a forest fire in the afternoon. So that's definitely something to uh, think about. Plants that thrive in the Pinelands need those conditions. The pitch pine is probably the ultimate survivalist when it comes to fire and is thus the most dominant tree uh, throughout the area and actually all of New Jersey. I think there's more pitch pine than any other tree in the state. Um, more on the water. Uh, Average, an average year in the Pinelands, you get about 40 inches of rain. The last few years, we've had a little more. We've actually been averaging over 60, if you look at say the last three or four years. So we definitely seem to be getting more rain. Fortunately, the aquifer, the grounds, the sand is able to hold it. Uh, if you ever went canoeing, you've probably seen some dark colored water, uh, generally we refer to it as cedar water. And uh, it's really as the vegetation, pine needles and things break down, it releases tannins. And those tannins react with oxygen. And uh, that's really the chemical uh, reaction that causes the water to turn kind of that dark or rusty color. Same pro process that a nail would rust with the same way if you left it outside. And that process also over thousands of thousands of years actually is what would create the bog iron that was harvested uh, here in the Pine Barrens. Um, the water table is generally that, you know, as far how far you can dig down to get water. And uh, that fluctuates uh, during the winter. That's when it's highest. Uh, when trees are growing in the summer, they use a lot of water. So 
once the leaves fall off in the fall and uh, the trees kind of stop growing for the year, that's when that water table comes up to its highest level. And, you know, right around this time is right about, you know, February, March, when the water table is at its highest. Some places in the pine lands, that water table actually comes to the surface. So, you know, we have a lot of vernal ponds, a lot of other places in the pine lands where the aquifer is exposed, and we'll talk about that quickly uh, as we go through. Here's our water, water everywhere. I can't do a pine lands presentation without talking about water. Um, the reason the pine lands has been protected is really to protect those water resources and the plants and the animals and us who thrive on the water. Um, here's a, a mod, the Kirkwood Cohansey aquifer model. The Cohansey is the top layer of sand. The um, Kirkwood's the bottom layer of sand, and it's literally layers of sand that hold water. It's not like a lake under the ground. It's uh, layers of sand that hold water. Um, you can see up here are the uplands that collect the water, and then the water builds up in our large aquifer system. We figure there's enough sand below the pine lands to hold 17.7 trillion gallons of water, which is a pretty large number. We estimate that's nearly half the water consumed in the U.S. each year. Uh, but we do realize if you, know, you eliminated the ability for water to recharge, over time, we would, you know, the water would run out. So it's one of the really important things about the Pine Barrens, Pine Lands, is to keep that open upland space to allow the area to recharge those aquifer resources. Um, you know, most of the people that live in Southern New Jersey get their water from either the Kirkwood Cohansi Aquifer or some of the other aquifer systems that are kind of connected or different layers, uh, you know, in the area. Um, here's just an aerial. This kind of brings it home pretty quickly. It just shows you uh, the, the Pinelands area, most of Southern New Jersey. Uh, there's seven counties in the Pine Barrens. Uh, the only one that's not is over here is Salem, but uh, Cape May, Cumberland, uh, Camden, Gloucester, Burlington, um, Ocean County, uh, and Atlantic County. Those seven are the seven counties that make up the Pine Barrens. And 80% of the area is actually um, Pinelands forest, undeveloped forest, or wetlands and water. And they're depicted on this satellite uh, image by the green and the blues. And uh, you might think 80%, wow, that's a lot. So if you look at that in reverse, the 20% is where primarily people live in the pine lands. So most of the pine lands is opened, undeveloped, and about 20% is where the, the population is. Uh, during the winter time or regular year, uh, the population probably is about 300,000 people live within the pine lands. And then of course, in the summertime with the shore, you have a, a larger uh, population uh, throughout the area. Um, real quick, just on watersheds, because I really want to focus on the critters, the plants and the animals. Um, we'll start up north. So the Barnegat Bay watershed, uh, water is going to flow from the Pine Barrens out to the Atlantic Ocean uh, through places like Tom's River, Cedar Creek, Forkett River, Oyster Creek, Mill Creek, uh, West of Chunk Creek, Mill Branch, and Tuckerton Creek. They all flow, you know, as I said, primarily east but some south, but at, terminate uh, primarily in Barnegat Bay and head to the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, the one that flows west to the Delaware is the Rancocas Creek watershed, and uh, that kind of heads over by Medford and out through Burlington County and spills into the Delaware. Um, the Mullica River water watershed, which is pretty unique and important, particularly tonight when we're talking about the Jacques Cousteau uh, National um, Estuarine Research Reserve, uh, that flows generally south, generally east, and that's going to be the Mullica River, the Batstow River, the Wading, the Oswego, the Bass River. Uh, Natco Creek, Mott's Creek, and Ballinger's Creek, and Landing Creek, and uh, lots of great places to go canoeing and kayaking. A little bit further south, we have the Great Egg. Uh, the Great Egg watershed flows down into Great Egg Harbor, which is down by Ocean City. Uh, it includes the Great Egg River, Tuckahoe River, English Creek, and Pennypot Stream. Uh, and again, they're, they're, some of them are actually going to go east and maybe a little north, depending on the um, geography. And then on the, the kind of western edge of the Pine Lands, flowing south, is the Morris River watershed. And the Morris River kind of goes right down the edge of the Pine Lands there and uh, flows into Delaware Bay. So they're the five watersheds that make up the area. And uh, here's a, just a map from 1776. And the other thing I want to point out about this map is 
you see where there's lots of towns on the shore, lots of inlets, and then lots of places over here, but it says Sandy Barren Desert. And that's what the Pine Barrens were uh, depicted as in 1776. Uh, here's a more modern day map of the Pine Barrens showing the Pine Lands National Reserve that was created in 1978 um, by the federal government. Uh, it includes 1.1 million acres, which is 22% of the state of New Jersey. Uh, then in 1979, um, the state itself uh, enacted the Pinelands Protection Act, which was signed by Brendan Byrne. And that act uh, put state legislation and created a commission called the Pinelands Commission to uh, create and write a comprehensive management plan. And that went into effect on January 14th, 1981, which is 40 years ago. So 40 years ago, the Pinelands uh, Comprehensive Management Plan or rules and regulations uh, were put in place by the state of New Jersey. Here's the original plan. Uh, it basically contains uh, rules and regulations to balance out development and the natural resources, but also try to uh, you know, encourage a compatible economy for the area. Um, it's kind of the, the cornerstone of the plan or management areas. I'll show you them in a minute. And it's kind of that breaks down uh, how we protect the natural resources, where things are developed, where things aren't developed. Uh, this is the map or the management areas. 60% is in conservation. That's primarily the green. So the preservation area, the forest area, and this different green area here is a uh, agricultural area and it's associated with wet ag, and that would be cranberries. So most of the cranberries are located right here in what's known as the Pinelands Preservation Area. Uh, another uh, agricultural area is the upland agriculture, which is also primarily the blueberries grow to the Pine Barrens. Both cranberries and blueberries are native Pinelands plants, and most of the cranberries today are grown uh, over in this area around Hamilton, New Jersey. So Chatsworth for cranberries and Hamilton for blueberries. Um, on the edge of the, the pine bands, uh, pine lands are more of the developed orientated growth areas. And you're gonna see that's the, the orange area, the yellow area. And then you have pine lands, towns and villages, uh, the uh, purple and the red. And, and those are all pre-existing prior to the uh, pine lands rules and regulations. But for the most part, over the last 40 years, well over, 70% of development has occurred in the orange area or the, the regional growth areas on the edge of the pine lands uh, that has public water, public sewer, and is more able to accommodate uh, you know, the, the, the higher density growth uh, that occurs there. Um, the rules and regulations have standards. All of those management areas uh, have to comply with uh, wetlands, vegetation, forestry, threatened, endangered, agriculture, uh, resource extraction, which is primarily mining of gravel, um, waste management, water quality, and air quality. So no matter what zone you're in, there's standards that apply to you know, how you're able to develop it. Uh, it's kind of a combination between uh, state law, municipal law, county, it all kind of works together. And uh, the co commission kind of oversees the whole process. And uh, as far as cultural resources, the plan also protects any historic resources talk about the remains of old buildings and also the prehistoric past. So we protect artifacts and cultural resources that could have been from some of the, you know, Native American populations that lived here, you know, well prior to the uh, European settlement. Um, so with that, we're gonna head out into the woods and start our kind of virtual walk. Um, this is a, a, a typical picture I could take in a thousand places. And uh, this is just an upland uh, pine area uh, you generally have uh, pine species, primarily pitch pine, uh, filtered in with some oak species. This guy over here is a blackjack oak. And then there's a lot of, on the lower level, what I would call a lot of heath uh, type plants. Uh, that's where the blueberries, the huckleberries, and you know sweet pepper bush, a lot of those other native pinelands uh, plants that we associate with the area uh, kind of fill in the understory. And uh, so this is your typical pine forest. We'll look at the different types of forest in the Pinelands. Um, generally in areas with a lot of fire, you're gonna find mostly pine. Areas that have a little less fire, you're gonna start to see a transition to oak. Areas where there hasn't been fire for a while, oak over time supersedes the pine. So where there's a real big fire history, pine is really dominant, primarily pitch. And when uh, fire kind of lacks off, 
that's when the oak species really have the upper hand. Um, a real, uh, oh, there we go. A real interesting uh, transitional area. You know, we generally talk about uplands and wetlands in between are what we call a pitch pine lowlands. And that is where we find both upland and wetland plants. And uh, it's really one of the key habitats to the area. Uh, and then we had two kinds of swamps I'll reference today. Uh, we have hardwood swamps where you're gonna find the maples, the cherries, um, the real pretty uh, leaves that fully out or uh, turn in the fall. And then we have Atlantic white cedar swamps. Atlantic white cedar, There we go, sorry about that. Having trouble with the buttons today. Uh, cedar swamps are great resources historically. Uh, the people who sell the area um, use cedar for boats and ships, uh, decoys, all kinds of things. And you know, it was really a, a valuable resource. Today we know that it's really valuable in terms of uh, its um, ecological uh, value as far as the resources and the threatened and endangered plants that we find in those uh, cedar swamps. Here are the, uh, the pine plains. Uh, sometimes people refer to it as the pygmy pines. Uh, there are four distinct kind of patches of these uh, kind of stunted trees that are out uh, in the general vicinity of Warren Grove, for instance, um, primarily pitch pine and also oak scrub species that just don't tend to grow very tall. Uh, the pine tends to grow upwards of uh, around six feet, some are a little taller, but as you can see from the photographs, you know, it's just, uh, you know, these trees might be 100 years old and that's as tall as they're gonna get. It's extreme fire habitat. It's the number two most dangerous fire habitat in the country. Uh, the only one that's considered more dangerous is the chaparral forest around Los Angeles over in uh, Southern California. So like I said, fire is an intimate part of the pinelands and the pinelands wouldn't be the way they are without uh, the continued influence of fire. Um, here is uh, some images from a controlled burn. And uh, the picture down here on the bottom is two weeks after a fire. So two weeks after that fire, the trees are already starting to re-sprout. Uh, here is six weeks after the fire. You can see the pine starting to grow and the oak starting to grow. You know, the forest fire doesn't destroy the pine barrens. It really just kind of reinvigorates it. And a lot of, in a lot of cases, probably is the best thing for that particular forest is to, to have some burning because that's typical and, and you know, what those plants are used to. Um, here's a, a fire from 2002. I think this is an image uh, from a helicopter, but just shows that interface. You know, fire is important, but you also have to wonder about where fire and houses come together. And uh, that's something that the rules and regulations kind of take into account and put in some buffers. So the fire will have a break before it gets to the, to the houses. And, uh, we have a New Jersey Forest Fire Service, and they, they're the ones out there doing the controlled burns to reduce the fuels. So when there's an uncontrolled fire, they're able to get a handle on it. All right, so now let's get into the wetlands. Uh, wetlands are really important. They make up 35% of the uh, pinelands area. We talked about the swamps and uh, most of our threatened and endangered animals, both plants and animals, either spend time in or are located always in uh, these wetland areas. Uh, the rules and regulations prevent development in wetlands and uh, they're really key to um, the, the animals and the plants in the pinelands. The difference between uplands and wetlands is the soil. Uh, wetlands have what's considered a muck soil, which generally drains slower. So uplands drain fast and wetlands drain slow. And because there's more water for longer times, you get a different suite of plants. Uh, this is a savanna. Uh, savannas are particularly important because there's a lot less canopy, so there's a lot more sunlight, and that's where, uh, you know, a lot of the flowers, a lot of the pretty orchids that grow in the pine barrens occur in these open area savannas uh, in these muck uh, soils. And again, just like everything else, the pH and the nutrients are very low, and that's what those uh, uh, orchids and other pinelands plants tend to like. Another really important place is, uh, you know, intermittent ponds. There's not a lot of natural lakes in the Pinelands, but there's thousands of these intermittent ponds. So this might be early summer. So I would say this picture probably is in May or June. Oh, 
And uh, then this picture here is in August. So what generally happens is the ponds fill up when the water table is high, like now. And then as the year progresses, those ponds slowly start to drain. And then some of them go completely dry, uh, you know, by late summer. That is fantastic for a number of critters in particular. Uh, many of the frogs, the toads, and the salamanders in the pinelands, they need that interaction. They need the water, but they also need it to dry out. Uh, one of the great things about the ponds drying out means that fish can't survive in the ponds and thus don't eat all the tadpoles and all the, all the frogs. Uh, I think there's 18 different frogs or toads that are found in the pinelands. And we have uh, at least two different salamanders that are, do occur in the pinelands area. Uh, this one right here, in some ways, is kind of the mascot, I think, of the, the pine barrens. Um, I'm going to date myself a little bit with this one. But when I was a kid, uh, the pine barrens tree frog was an endangered species. And over the last 40 years, uh, its status has been reviewed. And now it's considered a threatened species, which means uh, we still protect it. We have rules and regulations to protect it. Uh, but the population is in uh, much better shape. Uh, they're only about the size of your thumb, so they're pretty tall. I mean, pretty small, rather. Uh, they're primary nocturnal, so to find them, you need to be out at night. One of our scientists was out in the field and was able to get this picture of a uh, pine barren uh, tree frog calling. And uh, like I said, they're only about as big as my thumb. Um, talk about spring. These guys are a little bit of a late caller, so they haven't started calling yet. They tend to start to call. Uh, as the end of May comes around, really call a lot through June and then kind of wind up in July. Uh, so these, uh, the Pine Barrens tree frog in particular, tends to have a kind of a more of a summer calling season of that transition. Um, there are 500 animals that occur in the Pinelands and 43 that currently are considered a uh, threatened or endangered. Um, here are some of those other uh, native Pine Barrens frogs or Pinelands frogs. Um, we have the, the carpenter frog up here in the corner, and the carpenter frog, similar to the pine barrens tree frog, um, calls in that kind of transition May, June to July, and uh, we'll play the sound for you guys. sounds similar to a uh, somebody hammering a nail. Uh, both the carpenter frog and the pine barrens tree frog are only found in the pine barrens. They are not found any other parts of New Jersey. So they're just specific to the area. Uh, some other frogs that are considered native to the pine lands, but also are found in other spots are the southern leopard frog, um, the spring peeper. Both the leopard frog and the peeper are just starting to call. Um, right now is a great time to hear spring peepers. Um, this is just a single peeper. The spring peeper is also considered a tree frog. So it's in kind of the same family with the tree frog. And if you look at their fingers, they have pods, more of a rounded pod, whereas the true frog has more long digits like the southern leopard frog. Um, leopard frogs are calling right now. Uh, they're um, pretty loud, and a lot of times you see them in the same area with the peepers, so it's hard to distinguish. So they're going to call, you know, probably through April, probably wind up, uh, stop calling around May, both the peepers and the uh, leopard frog. Um, the Fowler's to toad is probably the most obnoxious. And uh, so brace yourselves for this one. Uh, they tend to be more of a summer uh, caller, and they tend to go right on through the summer, and you can hear them right up almost in the fall. 
probably the most prolific as far as number wise frog in the pine barrens is uh, this guy here, the green frog. And they're also more of a summer species. <laughs> I got a hot tip earlier that there's been recently some uh, eastern spadefoot activity. Um, spadefoot are kind of unique, where instead of having like a certain time of the year they call, they're opportunists. Uh, they call when there's been a lot of rain. So you have a couple days of thunderstorms, day like we had yesterday where we got a, over an inch of rain. It's a good opportunity. You're going to hear the spadefoot. And uh, this is what they sound like. <laughs> Now we'll look at some of the border species. Oh, wait a minute. We have a better opportunity. I forgot. This guy right here is a pine barrens tree frog calling. So uh, that was captured by our chief scientist, uh, John Bennell. He was out in the field and basically was able to use a headlamp. And when he heard the frog call, he could turn his headlamp on. And that's how he was able to capture that video of a, uh, a you know, a tiny little pine barren tree frog calling uh, in, a, in a probably a, a cedar area. You can see the sphagnum moss in the background and, uh, you know, pretty neat to be able to see. Um, they have a ability to kind of transfer air from bladder to bladder. And that is how they're able to that big puff is the air. And as they transfer that through a diaphragm, that's how they're able to, to make the call. Generally, it's the male frogs calling for attention and to uh, kind of get noticed. So that's generally what that is. The males are calling for hopefully to attract a female. Hey, Joel. Yes. Uh, we do have some questions about frogs and toads uh, in the chat. Um, the first one is which toad or toads uh, release toxins. Um, someone with a dog had a bad experience up in Maine. Um, is it the same around the pines? You know, I, I'm not sure. I've never heard of uh, that being a concern. Uh, primarily in the Pine Barrens, we have the Fowler's toad. Uh, there are some American toads as well, but we have definitely a higher population of the uh, Fowler's toad. Mm -hmm. um, and I've never heard about the spadefoot being toxic. So that, that, that's something I'm not so familiar with. Okay. Um, and then I think this is in reference to the Fowler's toad that made such that loud call. Um, how many in a group were making it that loud? Um, was that Lone Toka and past a small area that was very loud? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know. Generally, I, you find more than one of them. I do think the, you know, the, all these sounds come from a CD that was, uh, the commission made years ago the DEP as a partner where they went out and sampled uh, and you can still get the CD today uh, all of these native frogs so if you want to know about more of the frogs and the sounds on the DEP's website you can listen to them but you can also uh, download or buy the the actual CD and then you can kind of compare it's kind of tricky sometimes you know out in the field they sound a little different so you do have a hard time distinguishing from the different species mm -hmm. Yeah, sometimes you hear a bunch of them, uh, different ones all at the same time. So, yep. um, all right, great, thanks. I'll let you continue. Okay, great. Um, so the first frog to call every year, and we've had them on record calling in early February, is uh, the chorus frog. So generally the first frog to call in New Jersey is the chorus frog. I've uh, come up on a couple ponds and uh, it's a really eerie sound, uh, you know, especially when there's a thousand of them calling, you almost feel like you get vertigo. Uh, another pretty early caller, uh, generally the next frog we run across is the wood frog. Um, Uh, the 
wood frog is amazing. The wood frog tends to um, just stay in the leaf litter. So it stays in the forest, it stays in the leaf litter, and it has an amazing ability where it literally stops all of its functions. Its heart stops, blood stops flowing, and it literally, for all intents and purposes, stops uh, breathing. And then somehow when it gets to be the right temperature, usually around the end of February and March, everything starts back up and it's ready to go. And we don't exactly understand how it has that ability. Uh, scientists have been working on it for a long time to understand how we can have that level of um, non-life almost, but then be able to regenerate. And uh, it's just you know, one of those amazing things. Um, down here, we've got the cricket frog. A uh, cricket frog is more of a summer caller. This one kind of reminds me of a comb. If you ever had like a comb and kind of run your fingers against the bristles, that's what it sounds like to me. Or it sounds like some crickets calling. Uh, that's the other uh, two species that are pretty cool are uh, tree frog species. Uh, in more of the coastal area, I think we find the southern gray tree frogs been showing up. More of the northern areas, we have the northern uh, gray tree frog. They look exactly the same. Sometimes northern is referred to as Cope's uh, gray tree frog. The only difference is the sound, and that's how you tell the two species apart. So this is the northern. The northern sounds a little bit of a higher pitch than the southern, and here's the southern. Similar but different. Uh, this southern is in my backyard. I live in Tuckerton, and uh, it's right up against a cherry tree. And uh, I find them near my pool, which is gray. And when they're on the pool, or I have a Rubbermaid deck box, they blend into the same color gray. So they have the ability to kind of change their pigment to match their surroundings. And uh, that's both the southern gray and the, the northern gray. And then this guy over here is the pickerel frog. I thought I saw it. There it is. So, like I said, these are primarily border species. We wouldn't necessarily consider them native to the pine lands, but they certainly seem to thrive here. Uh, Generally, I don't like to have a bad guy in a presentation, but if there's a bad guy in this story, it's going to be the one right here in the middle, the bullfrog. Bullfrogs are bigger than the other frogs, and they prey, and so they eat the other frogs. Bullfrogs um, do not have the ability to reproduce in very acidic water. So for the most part, in the pine lands, pine barrens, the pH is too low, and bullfrogs can't reproduce. Now, unfortunately, uh, you know, things like uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, as they get into the area, they increase the pH, and then bullfrogs can kind of get a foothold. And what we start to see in those areas is those bullfrogs really um, kind of take away all the other species because they'll eat them. So we look at the bullfrogs as kind of an indicator species. So we find bullfrogs in an area on a regular basis. We know that area has kind of lost its, um, you know, pine barrens characteristics. On the opposite end is the pine barrens tree frog. We only ever find pine barrens tree frog in those very acidic, very low pH, very typical pine barrens, pine lands conditions. So in areas where we find pine barrens tree frogs, we know they've got those uh, characteristics still. Um, when we, we see a transition from a, a pine barrens tree frog to a bullfrog, usually we can determine there was some type of disturbance that kind of changed 
or altered uh, you know, the chemical balance that's going on there. Uh, we'll get into some of the snakes now, uh, some of the reptiles. Uh, 18 snakes also are known to occur in the Pinelands area. Uh, one of the most colorful is the corn snake up here. Uh, corn snakes are uh, primarily found in upland forested areas and are great tree climbers. Uh, we know and we found them many times up in trees. They will climb on the outside or if it's a hollow tree, they'll work their way right up through the center. Um, pine snakes are a threatened species in New Jersey. They're only found in the Pinelands and actually they have a pretty large population in the Pinelands. Um, they like to burrow. So typically the sugar sand and the gravels found in the Pinelands is perfect for them. And they are our largest species. Uh, there's been pine snakes uh, recorded at well over uh, eight foot long. Um, they're also probably one of our most docile species. Um, and they are known, particularly out on the pine plains and those pygmy pines, work their way up into pine trees and they definitely like to eat birds and bird eggs. So that's one of the, the things they've adapted to. Our only poisonous snake in the Pine Barrens is the timber rat, timber rat, rattlesnake. Um, and there are some areas with some pretty large pockets of timber rattlesnakes. Uh, for years, I only found them uh, unfortunately run over on the road. And within the last few years, I've had much more luck and been able to see a few live ones while I'm out doing some of my field work. Um, they're very shy uh, to get bit by one. I think you'd almost have to um, be real aggressive and try to catch it. For the most part, they'll just kind of go away or you'll never know they're there. Um, they're very timid. And uh, this is the sound you want to hear or don't want to hear. If you hear that and you're in the woods walking on a hike, I would generally just say slowly back up in the direction that you came from. Um, but they are the only poisonous snake in the Pinelands. Um, it's interesting, uh, pine snakes, hognose snakes, some of the other snakes will actually mimic. So part of their defense is to flap their tail and rattle like a rattlesnake, even though they don't really have the rattle. So other snakes def definitely mimic the pine snake. Um, down or the rattlesnake rather. Down here is the tiger salamander. Uh, the eastern tiger salamander is found in the Pinelands, uh, but primarily pretty low, south in, in like the Cape May area, down in those areas. Um, they need the water to lay the eggs, but they definitely need like a dry period in between, and then they need the water to come back. So the vernal ponds are key to their success. And uh, there's the up close of the rattle. Um, We've got a lot of other snakes, worm snakes, green snakes, uh, ribbon snakes, and the, the snake on the very left-hand side, this is a king snake. And they're called king snakes primarily because they feed on other snakes. And what we've learned about the king snakes is where we find a high population of any other snake species, we tend to also find the king snakes because they feed on other snakes. Um, this guy up here in the top, that's a hog nose. And uh, I got this picture in Brendan Byrne years ago. And if you notice, its head is very flat. And uh, that's not by accident. When they are uh, scared, they have a number of things they do. Uh, one is they roll over and play dead. Another is they flatten their head and they act like a cobra. And they'll also rattle their tail. So that's a, a hog nose trying to um, scare me away by flattening his head like it's a cobra. So it's pretty neat to see those uh, survival skills. And over here is uh, the eastern fence lizard. Um, I see them all over the place. I hear them a lot more than I see them. As you're walking down a trail or an old fire line, you'll hear some rustling and you'll look and you won't see it, they'll be gone. What they tend to do is when they take off, they go to a stump or a tree and they go up the tree and then they stop and look. So when you hear that rustling, make sure you look up or at the base of the tree because that's where you're gonna find those fence lizards and I find them very common throughout uh, the whole Pinelands area. Here are some of our turtles. Uh, snapping turtles are by far the biggest. Uh, I see them in a lot of brackish areas, but I've also seen them way out in the middle of uh, Wharton State Forest. 
uh, along with one of our smallest turtles, which is the spotted turtle. You can see the little yellow spots. Um, down here is a musk turtle. Another name for it is the stink pot, and they spend most of their time down in the bottom in the mud of the muck. And uh, if you ever handled one, you're going to know for a long time because it really takes a long time to get that scent off of your hand. Um, if you're canoeing and kayaking, all the streams and lakes in the pine lands, uh, you'll see a lot of these red bellies and a lot of the painted turtles. Um, generally, they'll be perched on the log. They'll get your camera up for the picture. And right as you're about to take it, they'll flop off in the water and you don't catch them. Um, and then right here is a uh, box turtle. Uh, box turtles, we generally kind of consider more upland, although I've seen them in lots of ponds and lots of wetland areas as well. Um, we'll say this is a male box turtle because of the bright colors, the yellow and the orange, and he's got a red eye. Uh, female box turtles tend to have a brown eye and don't have the, the vibrant colors that the males do. Um, here are some native fish. Uh, the Pine Barrens is very exclusive. Uh, you see we have the, the bandit sunfish, the black bandit sunfish, the mud sunfish, the swamp daughter pirate perch, and the yellow bullhead. They are only found in the Pinelands. They're very specific to the acidic water, and you don't see them in any other place except uh, areas with those conditions like the Pinelands. Um, We've heard tell of people actually um, poaching or trying to capture bandit sunfish because they're so pretty and they're a freshwater fish. Um, the chub sucker is a pretty interesting uh, fish. They get uh, you know about five or six inches long. We've got the eastern mud meadow. Um, and then down here, there's actually two species of uh, pickerel. We have the red fin and they have very distinct red fins. They're generally smaller. And then the chain pickerel, uh, the chain is the bigger of the two species. Uh, we don't have pike. Uh, so, you know, in New Jersey, we have in the Pine Barrens, we've got the pickerel, not the bigger uh, pike. And then we also find in almost all the lakes in the Pine Lands, we have American eels. And American eels are incredible. They spend a portion of their time out in the ocean in the Cigargo Sea. And then they find their way as they become uh, more mature up into the streams and we find them up into the lake. I think we've got a record of finding one that was about two and a half foot long, way up in Jackson in the headwaters of the Toms River. And uh, you know, eels are you know one of those amazing species. Slimiest one you're ever gonna grab. If you ever try to catch an eel, if you get a hold of it, it's gonna wrap itself around your arm and it's gonna be a slimy mess. Um, we've got some really interesting invertebrates. Uh, one of the uh, more famous invertebrates is the tiger beetle. If you're familiar with a lot of the uh, Pinelands writings, there's a guy by the name of Howard Boyd who wrote a lot of books on the Pinelands. And one of the reasons he came was to study uh, the tiger beetle. Um, the Argo skipper and the frosted elfin are both very rare and uh, considered uh, once endangered and once threatened. And then um, this one down here is the silver bordered uh, butterfly or flitterary. And that is another threatened species uh, that's found here uh, in the Pinelands. Um, birds of prey, uh, you know, the last, say, 15, 20 years, we're seeing a lot more bald eagles, particularly ospreys, too. Um, yesterday afternoon, I saw a really large red tailed hawk uh, flying in the air. Um, so, definitely, uh, you know, the sharp skin and the coopers are both smaller hawk species. I've seen them both in the area. And then of course the, uh, the peregrine falcon. So we've got a number of these uh, large birds of prey. And uh, if you're familiar with Rachel Carson and DDT, uh, you know, those birds really had a hard time, but they really do seem to be coming back pretty strong, uh, particularly in uh, our, both the Pinelands and the coastal areas. Um, another thing we're known for is we're known as a stopover. So there's a really large number of migratory birds that spend time north of us and spend a lot of time south of us. And in between, they come here and uh, fuel up, we'll say, in the Pinelands. Uh, one of the most prolific is the towhee. This is the rufous side of towhee. Um, just uh, maybe a day or two ago, I was out in the woods and I saw a pine warbler. Um, generally, midsummer in the fall, I start to see some of the nuthatches. 
uh, one of the most um, vibrant is the indigo bunting. And uh, then of course there's the goldfinch, which is uh, the state bird. And then also we have the common yellow throat. And this guy right here is the brown thrasher. Uh, the brown uh, thrasher doesn't like to fly very high. So it really enjoys and spends a lot of time out on the pine plains. And uh, that's when they're here, that's generally the best spot to see them. Um, also, we're known for the bluebird. Bluebirds tend to come through and migrate through the area. Um, we have uh, red-headed woodpeckers. They tend to be found in the real large forested areas. So generally places like Wharton State Forest, Bass River State Forest, away from development and uh, people. Um, the barred owl, I happened to be in the forest uh, this December and I was uh, resting in a tree and sure enough, right next to me landed a barred owl. And uh, I saw a flash, I saw the owl, and then slowly I watched its head turn all the way around to look at me. And he hung out there for about 15 minutes. It was a really cool experience. I don't think I'll ever forget. Um, the sedge worm, worm is an endangered species and the savannah sparrow are another endangered species that migrate through. Um, uh, not so much a migrator, but somebody who showed up here recently are turkeys. And I, I've seen turkeys all over the pine lands when I was a kid. I didn't necessarily see turkeys, but they have definitely started to uh, pop back up and they don't have a lot of predators. They've got incredible eyesight and they can fly. So say something like a coyote is not gonna catch the turkey because the turkey is just gonna fly up in the tree. Uh, some of our bigger mammals, uh, we've got the red fox. Um, you find them in coastal areas. I find them in the woods as well. Uh, definitely the gray fox is really um, specific to the real deep in the woods away from people. You don't see them very often. Uh, coyotes, I think you can find them anywhere. We know coyotes live in uh, Central Park in New York City. Um, they've been here for about 20 years, 25 years now maybe. And uh, when they first showed up, they had a great effect on the deer population. It crashed and now things have kind of balanced back out. Um, two species down here that I kind of wonder about. We hear stories and there's definitely sightings of black bear. Most of the black bears live in Northern New Jersey in, in the mountains. Every once in a while they get wandering and from time to time uh, they come through the pine lands. Uh, all 21 counties have reported black bear sightings, but I don't really think there's any um, population. And the same thing with the bobcat. Uh, people see bobcats or cats in the Pine Barrens from now time and time again. For the most part, I think it's just maybe a juvenile wandering, but there's really not a sustained population because there's so many cameras in the woods these days and they're not getting a lot of pictures of bobcats. So I just think that their population is up in northern New Jersey. Every once in a while, one might come down, but not typically going to be found here in our area. Um, muskrat raccoons, beavers, of course, white-tailed deer, and probably my all-time favorite uh, Pinelands animal is the flying squirrel. Uh, I've seen them up in Bass River State Forest. I've seen them on cameras where I just see a set of eyeballs go up a tree and then glide off and come on back up. Um, so they're, they're one of my favorite critters uh, in the area. We'll go into plants now. Uh, this is a swamp pink lily, which tends to be a spring bloomer. It starts to uh, bloom generally in May and uh, generally grows in wet cedar swamps. It grows about three foot tall. It has a really beautiful pink flower that can be about three inches tall. And uh, you know, it's, it's one of the more um, gorgeous plants you're gonna find in the, uh, the pine lands. It's, uh, it's in the lily family. Um, 850 total, 92 that are threatened and endangered. And there's 27 wild orchids and we'll see some of them as we go through. Uh, I can't uh, talk about the area without talking about two native plants, uh, blueberries, of course, and cranberries, uh, both part of uh, our culture and our heritage. Uh, both are protected through the Pinelands Plan. Uh, blueberries, like I said, mostly around Hamilton, but also in other places. And the cranberries primarily around Chatsworth. And uh, blueberries are harvested in June. And cranberries are harvested September through October. Uh, depending on the weather conditions, but they are really two large economic forces uh, in Southern New Jersey. Here's the pitch pine. Uh, generally pitch pine have what we say a uh, serotonous cone. They have some cones that aren't serotonous. Uh, most pitch pine have 75 regular 
and about 25 serotonous. The trees out on the pine plains have a different dynamic and they are actually 90% 90, 90 serotonous, only 10% non-serotonous. Serotonous need about 1200 degrees to kind of break the glue that holds them together where a regular pine cone will just open in the sunlight. Its biggest adaptation for fire is its bark. It's kind of like burning newspapers. You won't get through all the way to the tree. And uh, one of the reasons why our pitch pine are so kind of gnarly is because of that in, um, fire history over the time. Because once a fire comes, they may lose all their needles and new branches will just spurt right out of the side. And that accounts for kind of the gnarly shape that we see a lot of our pitch pine. Um, pitch pine aren't the only pine. We also have a short leaf pine. Generally short leaf pine have a lot more cones and are a lot smaller. And then down south, particularly uh, in Cape May County, but also in a few other spots, you're gonna see the Virginia pine. Uh, Belle Plain State Forest is a great spot to see some of those Virginia pine. Um, the other real dominant tree besides the pitch pine in the pine lands is this guy right here, the uh, blackjack oak. You find them all over the place. And uh, that is the second most dominant species throughout the pine lands is the blackjack. Um, uh, this time of year is the springtime. And uh, last week I was up near the Warren Grove bombing range in the Stafford Forge portion up there by 539. And the uh, male broom crowberry plants were just in bloom. And uh, they're a really good example of a northern plant. So the furthest south you ever find them is right here in the Pinelands. They were kind of pushed down probably by the glaciers. So they're a northern plant you might find in the tundra in Canada and Alaska. But the furthest south you'll find them is right here in the Pine Barrens. And then on the opposite end of the spectrum is turkey beard. Turkey beard is another Maytime bloomer. And they're considered a southern plant, but the furthest north you ever find them is right here in the Pine Barrens. And I start to see them bloom uh, generally in the beginning of May, and they bloom pretty good. They're again really tall and about a three foot tall stalk with a real pretty white cone flower on the top. And uh, I see them throughout um, upland areas, but I also see them in a lot of those um, pitch pine lowland areas and some of those transitional areas leading in the wetlands. One of our most uh, prettiest uh, upland plant is uh, the pink lady slipper. Um, we always tell people, please don't try to take them because they will not transplant. Uh, if you see one, uh, generally just leave it be because if you take it home and try to replant it, it is gonna die. And that's one of our prettiest upland plants. And then one of our uh, orchids, you'd see generally, this is a late bloomer, so you see these, in August, um, September, and October is the Pine Barrens Gentian. And you see them in actually wetlands, but you also see them on the side of roads in the shoulder where they hold a lot of the water. One of the unique uh, Pinelands plants I like, there's a great patch up in Wells Mills, is the prickly pear cactus. And uh, over here is a Pickering's Morning Glory. That's a very rare plant that we find in the area. Um, we also have some pink water lilies. We have white lilies and we also have a yellow or spatter dock. And then uh, another um, kind of transitional uh, species, definitely the end of May, early June is when you're gonna see the mountain laurel. And I would suggest the prettiest time to drive around the pine lands is that last week in May, first week of June, because that's when you're gonna see the mountain laurel in full bloom. And then bushy beer grass here is one of my favorite plants because it is really a wetland plant. And when you find it in an upland setting, it tells you right away that that's an area where the water table comes very high. So that's a, you know, a pretty strong indicator of uh, wetland soils. Uh, some of our stream plants, uh, Golden Club will start to bloom really soon. Uh, if you're ever around At Sign, the whole north side of At Sign Lake is loaded with this uh, Golden Club. This is another one of those species that's very, um, only gonna tolerate a low pH. Uh, this is cotton grass. I see these in a lot of savannas, but along stream beds, there's a whole bunch of different types of reeds and grasses. Um, another one of my favorite plants is swaying bulrush. If you ever go canoeing, it's like long hair you'll see flowing. And that's where all those little fish can hide from the pickerel. And uh, it's a really key component of their habitat, but it has a very, very silky feel. 
And then there's this alga, alga pond weed is another uh, real specific pinelands plant that only occurs in this area because of the pH. We're known for carnivorous plants and uh, uh, we have bladder warts, which are more or less an aquatic plant that has a flower above the surface. We've got the purple and then the horned uh, and they have a sac under the water that works as a filter and is able to uh, you know, filter out some of the microorganisms. Um, we've got the thread leaf sundew, the round leaf sundew. They're able to hold and digest uh, insects. And then of course, we've got the, uh, the pitcher plant, uh, generally referred to as the purple pitcher plant, uh, depended on um, the light conditions. I've seen them green, I've seen them red, and uh, they hold water and bugs come in. And once the bugs come in, they have a really hard time going out. Um, for the most part, the bugs actually live within the pitcher plant. The pitcher plant digests the waste from the bug. And it's not until really the bug dies of natural causes. There are some enzymes that kind of help break down. But once the bugs die, then the pitcher plant can uh, break down and digest the actual live, the insect when it's no longer live. Uh, we'll talk about some of the orchids. Uh, so we've got the orange fringed orchid, uh, the southern yellow orchid. Uh, these are primarily um, late June, July bloomers. And that's the same time we see the bog asphodel, uh, the grass pink. Bog asphodel is worldwide distribution is limited to the pinelands. So this plant we know doesn't occur anyplace else except the New Jersey pinelands. Uh, it occurs in those um, wetland savannas. So in areas where those wetland soils allow the water table to come right to the surface and there's a lot of open sunlight is where we find the, uh, the bog asphodel. And it usually grows right along with a golden crest, which is kind of almost looks like a bone. And it's got a real pretty little delicate yellow flower. And you usually find all these plants relatively close together. Small plants, tiny plants, uh, two of my favorite and very important are the sphagnum moss. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different varieties of sphagnum moss that occur in the pine lands. Uh, years ago, it was harvested. Uh, it was used by the Native Americans to cure diaper rash. It was used in World War I because it's so um, almost as an antiseptic from the acidic water that they actually shipped it to Europe and used it to mend wounds from the soldiers uh, during World War I. They used to use a lot of it in the flower industry and it was harvested and pressed and that is no longer taking place. So nobody's taking sphagnum moss out of the forest anymore. And one of our real famous plants and smallest plants is the curly grass fern. Uh, they tend to only grow maybe uh, one to two inches and they're actually a fern and they've got a little fiddlehead once they, uh, they grow and they've got little spirally little circles. And uh, you know, botanists have been coming to the Pinelands since the 1700s to see the curly grass fern and you can still see it today. Uh, to kind of wind down, I just want to talk a little bit about um, responsible recreation. Uh, this is one of those vernal ponds. This is a pond that we study <coughs> every year. We know it's got a very large population of a number of those pine barren um, tree frogs. Uh, I've heard peepers out there. I've heard uh, leopard frogs out there. And if you look really closely, you can see that there's some tire tracks along this backside. And I'd like to encourage people, if you're gonna be out in the pine lands to um, and recreate, to drive around, to do it in a responsible manner. Uh, stay on the roads, um, don't take your vehicle and don't drive through a pond because when you do, you're destroying the habitat of uh, you know, some of these plants and unique animals that we just saw. Um, you know, I always tell people to leave no trace, kind of leave nothing behind. Don't put your trash in the pine lands. Don't uh, leave things out there. Um, stay on the roads. Do not drive through the bogs, the meadows. Uh, even the surveys and the fire lines, they're not meant for vehicles. Um, if you're gonna go out there, drive only legal vehicles. You can drive a car, you can drive a truck, but uh, four wheelers, for instance, and two stroke motorcycles are not licensed and legal vehicles to drive. So therefore you shouldn't be out in the state forest areas in particular with them. If you like to go hunting or fishing, that's great. The Pine Barrens are absolutely fantastic places for both, but I also would tell you just to follow the rules and know the regulations and you never know who's watching. Uh, could be the Jersey Devil, 
it could be a conservation officer. So if you're going to be out there, you know, just uh, know what's going on and, and try not to break the laws. Uh, here's an example where somebody decided to drive through one of our really nice uh, dry ponds. So this pond fills up and dries and somebody decided to drive through and, and just tear it up. And all it really is, is just damaging our habitat and, uh, you know, limiting the possibilities for the plants and animals that called it home. Uh, and the same thing, I right? don't go out, don't dump trash. You know, we see this unfortunately far too often where people just take their stuff out to the woods and dump them. And I'd really, uh, you know, strongly tell people that that's just not the way to go. There's lots of recycling centers and a much better way to handle your trash than to just take it out and dump it in the pine barrens. Um, if you see someone doing that, uh, you know, you have options. Uh, you can call the NJDEP hotline. Uh, here's the number right there. Uh, if you see that, if you see somebody uh, driving in a pond or dumping trash where they shouldn't be, and then if you see someone with a wildlife violation, uh, here's the numbers. And uh, you know, please feel free to call. You'll get a response, and they'll do what they can to 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 stop that impact. Um, uh, to wrap things up, I'm not sure if I'm over time or not. I probably am. I always talk too long. Um, uh, if you want to learn more about the pine lands. Coming up on uh, April 24th, we're going to have a virtual Pineland short course. It's going to be a little different this year. It's going to be called a, a Pineland short discussion. And we're going to interview uh, five kind of Pinelands veterans and get their take on uh, what they love and you know what's so important to them about the Pinelands area. Um, I work for the New Jersey Pinelands Commission. I'm our public programs office. And uh, we're happy to do uh, virtual programs, in-class programs, even field trips. Um, not right now, but once uh, the COVID situation goes back to normal, uh, we've got a really neat uh, Pinelands educational exhibit that you're welcome to come see at our office. Our office is located in uh, Pemberton or New Lisbon, New Jersey. Uh, and if you'd like to stay up to speed with what we have going on in uh, education and other events in the Pinelands, we have a Pinelands news alert, and you can sign up for that at our website, which is uh, NJ gov slash pinelands. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll be glad to uh, chat and talk some more. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to share uh, the plants and animals of pinelands. Excellent. Thank you so much, Joel. We're all giving you a, a virtual round of applause right now. That was fantastic. A lot of critters, a lot of information. Um, and also, I just want to say that um, your Pineland short course every year is always so well done and have so many great speakers. So I encourage folks to attend that. Um, it's such a great experience. Um, and uh, you guys have such a fun exhibit there, too. So hopefully you can have some folks visit you soon and school students soon. Um, but thank you so much. Um, we are over a little bit. So um, if you do have to run, I totally understand. But if um, anyone has any questions um, to wrap things up, um, you can type them into the chat or take yourself off mute. We don't, you know, it's not like we have um, a thousand <laughs> people on the call and have to manage uh, um, the, the chat box um, or people coming off mute. Um, so if you want, if you do want to take yourself off mute and ask your question that way, that's okay too. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, um, let me just check the chat here to see if anyone, um, did put something in. I don't see any questions quite yet. Um, does anyone have anything that they'd like to ask off mute? Oh, how do we register for the short course? I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, that's a great question. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you can visit uh, our website, the New Jersey Pinelands Commission. There's a link. I partner with Stockton University and uh, on their continuing studies office has the re registration available. Um, it's gonna be a free program, but we do want everybody to register so we know who's available. And uh, it'll be a Zoom program like this. It's gonna be uh, at 10 o'clock in the morning on uh, April 24th. And uh, like I said, through our website or through Stockton, uh, you can sign up and uh, we got uh, five really unique people. Um, that all have a different perspective on the Pinelands, and it's going to be an opportunity to uh, kind of learn from them about, you know, their their thoughts of, about what's so unique and special to them about the area. 
Uh, Joel, I just put the link in the chat to register for the short course. I, I believe I found it. Awesome. So, um, yep, that link should have all the information there. Um, anybody else? I noticed, Joel, you had some photos of non-native species, I think especially frogs and toads. Um, how did they get into the Pine Barrens? Uh, there, there's a number that are kind of like border species that have just over time kind of transitioned into the area mm -hmm. and, and some seem to uh, survive pretty good. Um, you know, particularly with disturbance like the bullfrog is a, a good example. Uh, if areas have a lot of fertilizer and nitrogen and phosphorus come in, that'll increase the pH. And uh, that's when those, uh, you know, bullfrogs really tend to kind of get a niche or a foothold and can really expand their, their territory. Mm, okay. It is amazing how many uh, pineland specific species there are. It's really great in both critter and plant. So yep. it's, it's so neat. Yeah, one of the really cool things I think are those pinelands fish. Uh, you know, some of those small species like the, the bandit and the black bandit sunfish, literally there's no place else you find them except these very, you know, acid low pH uh, habitats mm -hmm. like we have here. Yeah. Very um, species specialists. <laughs> yeah. You know, like the, the carnivorous plants, there's not a lot of nutrients in our soil. So they have an adaptation where they're able to digest the bugs and insects and, and get their nutrients that way. Yeah, that's so that's amazing. All right. Any other any questions for Joel before we um, let everybody go for tonight? All right. Well, uh, thanks again, Joel. And again, if you want to learn more about um, the Pinelands Commission, um, you can go to that website and Joel's uh, email is right there if you'd like to touch base with him. Yep. Um, Joel, thank you so much for taking time out of your evening to be our speaker tonight. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, I hope everybody has a great evening or rest of your evening tonight. Um, you can always email me if you have any questions. I'll put my question, my um, uh, email in the chat right now uh, if you need to reach out to me for any reason. Oh, and I just messed up my <laughs> email quite badly, so I'll do that again. Um, but thank you, everybody, and thank you again, Joel. Uh, have a great evening, everyone. Yep. Joel. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank Bye. you, Joel. Yep. No problem. Bye, Caitlin. Bye, George. Thanks Take for coming. Care.